This project will add solar-powered sensors and home automation to my vegetable garden and transmit the data using MQTT for review and control on a mobile app. My videos are fast-paced, but all the code, notes, and images are posted on my website. The link is in the video description. Here's the raised garden bed set up in my backyard. It's made by an Australian company called Vegapod. The canopy protects the vegetables from deer, squirrels, and other pests. It also reduces weeds and mitigates harsh weather. Yet the permeable canopy doesn't block sunlight, rain, or fresh air. There are four pods that utilize a wicking system to water the plants from below. Underneath the platform in each pod is a reservoir. Irrigation water drains through the soil and is collected. Vegapod claims that the vegetables can last for weeks without watering once the reservoirs are full. There's a built-in mist sprayer on top of the canopy that I've connected to an automated sprinkler valve. In my workshop, I fabricated a mounting for a solar panel and an electronics enclosure. I used scrap pieces of steel flat bar and square tubing. The panel bracket is adjustable, so the angle can be optimized for the season. It's currently at about 17 degrees. An inexpensive watertight steel ammo box will hold the battery, solar charge controller, and other electronics. A wind speed sensor caps the top of the tube. I'll be using the solar panel and MPPT charge controller from my previous Raspberry Pi Solar Serial REST API tutorial. In that video, I used a Raspberry Pi to gather solar data and transmit it to a React Native app. This project will use an ESP32 instead and transmit data using MQTT to a home automation system. The wiring is very intuitive. The positive and negative leads from the panel are connected to the corresponding terminals on the controller. The positive and negative terminals from a 12-volt battery are connected to their corresponding terminals too. An inline fuse should be placed within 15 centimeters of the battery's positive terminal. An ESP32 running MicroPython will be used to pull the controller for voltage and current levels. A step-down regulator will drop the 12-volt DC output of the controller down to 5-volt to power the ESP32 via its micro-USB jack. The 3.3-volt TTL communication lines from the MPPT charge controller are connected to the ESP32's serial port number 2, TX to RX GPIO 13, and RX to TX GPIO 15. The grounds are also connected. For a more detailed look at the wiring, please watch the previously mentioned tutorial. In addition to collecting solar power and battery data, the ESP32 will also monitor four other sensors. The temperature in the Vegapod will be monitored with a DS18B20, which is a very reliable outdoor temperature sensor. The reservoir water level will be monitored with mechanical float switches. A magnetic reed switch will monitor if the canopy is open or closed. A wind speed sensor will watch out for windy conditions, especially if I forget to close the canopy. I live in an area with strong winds. The DS18B temperature sensor has three wires. The black ground wire is connected to a ground on the ESP32. The red VCC wire is connected to a 3.3 volt pin. The yellow data wire is connected to GPIO5. A 10K ohm resistor is placed across the VCC and data lines. By the way, you don't have to use GPIO5 for the data. Any available input-output GPIO should work for the data line. Liquid level switches will be used to monitor the water level in the Vegapod reservoirs. The switches are made for food and agricultural compatibility. The switch is polypropylene, and the wires are coated with Teflon, both of which are food safe for growing vegetables. A magnetic switch is fired based on whether the mechanical float is up or down, reflecting the water level. I'll be using two switches. I CNC a mounting extension out of UHMW plastic, which is also food safe and doesn't interact with water. The 3 8 inch nylon nut that came with the level switch will secure the adapter. A hole allows the wires to be fed through. The level switch then screws into the other end of the adapter. The adapter offsets the vertical position of the two switches. This will allow for three level readings. If both switches are up, the reservoir is full. If the top is down and the bottom is up, then the reservoir is half full. If they're both down, then the reservoir is empty. If the top one is up and the bottom one is down, then something's broken and an error state exists. I drilled two holes in one of the reservoir platforms and screwed in both liquid level sensors so they'll be submerged. The bottom sensor will extend to the bottom of the reservoir the top sensor is mounted near the top. The Teflon wires are routed through an existing overflow hole in the side of the Vegapod. The sensors are easy to wire to the ESP32 because they're just like regular switches. One lead from each sensor is connected to a ground on the ESP32. The other lead from the top one is connected to GPIO14. 
the other lead from the bottom one, is connected to GPIO 12. The magnetic read switch used to monitor the state of the canopy is also just a switch. One lead is connected to ground, and the other lead is connected to GPIO 27. A magnet on the canopy will align with the read switch on the pod when the canopy is closed. When the magnet is aligned, the switch will close, and vice versa. Connecting the wind sensor requires a little more work. It requires 12 volt power, so it'll be powered directly from the 12 volt load terminals on the charge controller. The wind sensor's black brown wire is connected to a negative terminal, and the brown wire is connected to the 12 volt positive terminal. It's recommended to use an inline fuse. The wind speed sensor outputs a varying current, which has a linear correlation to the wind speed. The easiest way to measure the current is with an INA219 current sensor. I have a previous tutorial dedicated to this current sensor. The INA219 ground is connected to a ground on the ESP32. The VCC pin is connected to a 3.3 volt pin. The INA219 communicates using I2C protocol. The SCL or serial clock pin is connected to GPIO18. The SDA or serial data pin is connected to GPIO19. The yellow wire from the wind sensor is connected to the VIN positive pin. The blue wire is connected to the VIN negative pin. The INA219 will transmit a digital number representing the current from 4 to 20 milliamps, which translates from 0 to 30 meters per second of wind speed, or about 108 kilometers per hour, or 67 miles per hour. I designed a very simple PCB to hold the ESP32, the INA219, and pin headers for easy wire connections. This will simplify the wiring in the outdoor enclosure and provide a more tidy and easy to maintain environment. I designed and 3D printed a bracket to hold the PCB in the outdoor enclosure. The bracket mounts to and also secures the solar charge controller. Here's the PCB which I etched myself and the bracket 3D printed in white PLA. The ESP32 plugs into the female pin headers on the left and the INA219 plugs into the female pin headers on the right. The right angle male pin headers are for the sensor wire connections. Here's a 30 caliber metal ammo can. I mounted a Wi Fi antenna on the side because it's effectively a Faraday cage that'll block electromagnetic fields. The lid is easily removed and has a liquid tight rubber gasket. I drilled a hole in the bottom of the case and installed a strain relief connector for the wiring. Turning the connector compresses a grommet, creating a good seal around the wires. A 12 volt 7.2 amp hour rechargeable sealed lead acid battery will power the electronics. Since the battery is sealed, it can be mounted on its side to maximize space in the can. The MPPT solar charge controller will also be mounted on its side. The can is a good fit for the battery and the controller, and there's still plenty of room for the electronics and wiring. The controller will be held in place by the PCB bracket, which locks into the holes in the side of the controller. Once the brackets fit, the controller is held securely. A 5 amp blade fuse is in line with the battery's positive lead in a waterproof harness. The antenna wire will plug into the external miniature RF connector on the ESP32. I'll go ahead and powder coat the mounting pieces since they'll get a lot of outdoor exposure. I picked a camo green color that should blend in with the landscape and match the ammo can. It's hard to film while spraying. I'm holding the gun too close to the metal, but it probably won't matter as long as I don't put it on too thick. The positively charged powder is held electrostatically to the grounded metal. Next, the piece is placed in a toaster oven and baked at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, about 200 degrees Celsius. 12 minutes later, and the piece can be removed from the hot oven. The powder coating is complete, it just needs to cool down. Here's the before and after shot. The finish looks good and the coating should last a very long time. I sunk the square steel tube in a concrete footing next to the VegiPod and gave it a coat of camo green paint. An old reclaimed barn hinge is bolted to the tube. Two 6mm stainless steel screws will go through the tube and also be used to hold the ammo can. The other two screws near the top of the hinge are retained with nuts on the inside of the tube. The hinge will allow the solar panel to tilt to optimize the angle relative to the sun. Under the hinge, a steel bracket will be attached. It'll hold the solar panel's adjustable arm and allow it to pivot for different angles. I tap two 6mm holes into the steel tube to retain the screws. The solar panel's adjustable arm is bolted to the bracket with a 6mm screw along with several washers and a nut. It's only loosely tightened to allow the arm to swing up and down. Next, the solar panel is bolted to the hinge. It's a Renogy microcrystalline 50 watt panel. It's overkill for this application, but 
I plan to add a greenhouse down the road that will require significantly more power. Next, the solar panel is swung up and the adjustable arm is connected to the bracket on the bottom of the panel, again with 6mm stainless steel fasteners. The hardware works well to securely hold the solar panel in position. Next, the wind speed sensor caps off the top of the tube. It's held in place with a bead of silicone, which will also keep water out of the tube. It's a bit windy this afternoon. The cups are catching the wind. Looks like it's working. Finally, the ammo can is mounted to the back, using the same two bolts that secure the bottom of the hinge and protrude through the back of the tube. Later, I'll add some silicone around the nuts to ensure water stays out of the can. All right, the hardware's done, except for connecting the wires, which I'll do off camera. Now let's take a look at the software. Here's a short MicroPython program I wrote called vegapod.py. From DS18x20, import DS18x20. This library supports the DS18b20 temperature sensor. From INA219, import INA219. This MicroPython library is for the INA219 current sensor. It was written by Chris B2. He also wrote the INA219 Python library that I used in my Raspberry Pi power measurement tutorial. From logging, import info. This module is required by the INA219 library. From MicroPython, import const to declare constants. From machine, import I2C, pin, and UART for controlling the I2C bus, the GPIO pins, and the serial ports respectively. From one wire, import one wire and one wire error. This is for the one wire bus that drives the DS18B20 temperature sensor. From settings, import get P2. Rather than hard coding my MQTT password into the code, I wrote a short library with a function that returns the password. I then precompiled the program into an MPY binary container, which is only importable by MicroPython programs. It's not technically secure, but it would require much more effort to hack than a password stored in plain text. From time, import sleep. From tracer, import tracer, tracer serial, and query command. These support the solar charge controller. This is a MicroPython port I created of the XXV Python library that I used in my Raspberry Pi Solar Serial REST API tutorial. I'll post the code on my website. From uJSON, import dumps. This module allows converting Python objects to JSON. From uMQTT simple, import MQTT client. This lightweight MQTT client affords publishing and subscribing to MQTT topics. I previously posted a Raspberry Pi MicroPython MQTT tutorial. I recommend you take a look if you're not familiar with the MQTT protocol. An MQTT client is instantiated. A unique ID is assigned. The server IP address is specified. For the server, I'm running the open source Mosquito package on a Synology NAS. You can also run Mosquito on a Raspberry Pi, which I demonstrated in the aforementioned tutorial. Several sensor constants are defined. Empty, mid, error, and full represent the bitwise state of the water level sensors. Canopy on and off indicate the binary state of the Vegapod canopy. Level upper is set to GPIO 14. The GPIO is set to input to read the level sensor switch, and the pull up is turned on so the pin doesn't float. Lower level is set to GPIO 12 and is also an input with the pull up on. Canopy magnet is set to GPIO 27 and is set as an input to read the read switch. The pull-up is also set on. Two extra GPIO pins, 23 and 4, are defined as inputs. These are just in case I decide to add any sensors in the future. Next, the INA219 is configured. A constant shunt ohms is set to 0.1. This is the value of the shunt resistor on the INA219 breakout board. The I2C bus 0 is instantiated. Serial clock is set to GPIO 18, and serial data is set to GPIO 19. An INA219 sensor is defined and passed the shunt ohms, the I2C bus, the maximum expected amps, which is set to 40 milliamps. The wind sensor shouldn't go above 20 milliamps, but I'm leaving some optional overhead. The INA configure method is called. Voltage range is set to 16 volts. The wind sensor is 12 volts. The gain is set to 40 millivolts, which is the lowest option. The bus and shunt ADC are set to ADC128 SAMP which provides the highest 12-bit resolution and performs 128 samples per read for more reliability. INA sleep is called to put the INA219 sensor to sleep and save power until it's needed. Next, the DS18B20 temperature sensor is set up. 
DAD is set to GPIO5. DS instantiates a DS18B20 sensor on the one wire bus at GPIO5. DS scan finds the sensor and returns it to the variable ROMs. It's possible to daisy chain multiple DS18B20 sensors on the same bus, so ROMs could contain multiple sensors. The results are printed to the console for debugging purposes. Next, the solar charge controller is configured. Port is set to serial port 2 at 9600 baud. RX is GPIO 13 and TX is GPIO 15. The tracer is instantiated and pass hex 16, which I believe is the default ID. A tracer serial is instantiated and pass the tracer in the port. A query command is instantiated and the serial port is flushed to clear any pre existing data. A function called getData is declared. It'll query the solar charge controller and return the results. The function is wrapped in a try to catch errors, which is a good practice any time input or output operations are performed. The send command method is passed the query command. This instructs the charge controller to return data via the serial port. A small sleep is required to ensure the query is processed. If there's any data in the serial buffer, then it's stored in the variable data. If no data is retrieved, then an error message is returned. If the serial port buffer is empty, then an error message is returned. And accept catches any operating system errors. The main program loop is wrapped in a try statement to catch errors, and will run indefinitely. A blank dict called vegipod data is declared. Another try statement is used to wrap the polling of the temperature sensor. The dsconvert method initiates a temperature reading on the DS18B20. A short sleep is used to ensure a complete reading. The dsreadTemp method returns the temperature in Celsius to a variable temp from the first sensor on the one wire bus. Currently, there's only one sensor. Tempf stores the temperature converted to Fahrenheit. Both temperature values are printed to the console for debugging. The temperature key is added to the vegipod data dict and set to the temperature in Fahrenheit, rounded to one decimal place. Any one wire bus errors are captured, any runtime errors are captured, and any other unknown errors are captured. The wake method wakes the INA219 from sleep. A small sleep is used to allow the sensor to fully wake up. The INA current method returns the wind speed sensor output current to a variable I. INA sleep puts the current sensor back to sleep. The variable wind is set to the wind speed in meters per second using a linear formula provided by the vendor of the wind speed sensor. Wind KPH holds the wind speed converted to kilometers per hour. Wind MPH holds the wind speed in miles per hour. All three speeds are printed to the console. A wind key is added to the vegipod data dict and set to the wind speed in miles per hour. The get data function is called to pull the solar charge controller and the results are stored in a variable data. If the data variable is a string, then an error occurred and the message is printed to the console and the serial port is flushed. Otherwise, the collected solar data is printed to the console. Keys are created in the vegipod data dict for battery, panel, charging, and load. They're set to the battery voltage, the panel voltage, the charge current converted to milliamps, and the load current converted to milliamps. The water level is computed by left shifting the upper water level switch by one and orienting it against the value of the lower switch. This represents the four possible states of the two switches, which is empty, mid, full, or error. The level MSG variable stores the value. The water level is printed to the console. A key called level is added to the vegipod data dict and set to the water level message. The vegipod data dict is dumped to JSON format and printed to the console for debugging purposes. A variable canopy MSG holds the state of the vegipod canopy. The state is either set to canopy on and printed to the console or canopy off and printed. The try statement wraps all MQTT communication. Client connect is called to establish a connection with the Mosquito MQTT broker running on my Synology NAS. Another try statement wraps the publish statements. Client publish is called. The topic is set to Home Assistant Sensor Vegipod State. This topic will be subscribed to by an open source automation app called Home Assistant that's also running on my Synology NAS. Dumps is called to convert the Vegipod data dict to JSON format, which is supported by Home Assistant. A print statement indicates a successful publish. A second publish is necessary for the canopy state 
because Home Assistant handles binary sensor data separately from other sensor data. The topic is set to Home Assistant Binary Sensor Vegipod State. The canopy MSG on or off value is transmitted. A print statement indicates a successful publish. Accept catches any operating system errors related to MQTT publishing and prints them to the console. Client disconnect is called to disconnect from the MQTT broker. Another accept catches operating system errors related to the MQTT connection and prints them to the console. The values of the two extra GPIO pins are printed. The main program loop sleeps for 10 seconds and then repeats. Accept catches control C and gracefully exits the program. Finally ensures that the serial port is deinitialized. Okay, that takes care of the software. Everything is set up. You can see the white magnetic read switch on the side of the Vegipod. I filled the Vegipod with 420 soil mixed with perlite. I planted Chandler strawberries, pickling cucumbers, bush beans, and sugar baby watermelons. I've never tried to grow vegetables before, so this is all new to me. The blue irrigation line is high density polyethylene, which is food safe, recyclable, and not toxic like PVC. Everything's powered up and sending data to Home Assistant. Fast forward two weeks and I think all the plants are growing very well. Home Assistant automatically waters them four minutes every day, unless it's raining. Here's the free Home Assistant app running on my phone. The first tab shows my home lights, fountains, and irrigation. I can press any of the lights that turn them on or off. Pressing the fountain starts the pump, and the sprite shows water flowing. The next tab is for the Vegipod. It's 86.4 degrees Fahrenheit in the pod. The outside temperature is 69.3 degrees, with 53% humidity. The canopy is currently open, but I'll go ahead and close it. The image updates to show the closed state. It'll also update if the reservoir water level changes. It's currently filled midway. The wind speed is 2.9 miles per hour. The green fan spins when the sensor spins. The chart below tracks the outside and Vegipod temperature. The canopy acts like a greenhouse and keeps the interior substantially warmer. The next tab tracks the solar and battery power. The battery is at a healthy 13.6 volts. It's sunny today and the solar panel is generating around 21 volts and charging the battery at 100 milliamps. The chart below tracks the battery voltage relative to the solar panel voltage. At nighttime, the panel voltage drops to zero, but the battery never goes below 12.5 volts. And in the morning, the battery quickly charges back up. Switching back to the Home tab, I'll go ahead and turn on the Vegipod Mist Sprayers. Home Assistant's a very powerful free app with a great community that supports it. It can run on a computer, a NAS, or a Raspberry Pi and it now has a GUI that makes it even easier to use. I hope you like this video. You can support this channel by subscribing, leaving a like and sharing. Thanks for watching.